going. Balia, good to see you. Um, there will be folks that are likely going to file in um, as we continue our discussion. I do have the chat uh, window open. If you have a comment or want to weigh in or a question or want to share a link, whatever, please make sure that you um, put that in the chat window. I am, um, I, I would like to ask everybody to kind of, you know, weigh in. If I miss something in the chat, let me know. Um, I will try to check it periodically. Um, but uh, I'm going to lean on my colleague, Suzanne and Mitzi, a little bit to help me kind of watch that chat window, if, if y'all would. Um, so, so um, I want to go ahead and, and kind of give y'all a plan for the next hour and let you know what we're going to talk about. So uh, as, as you know, this is a, a workshop on, on questioning in the classroom, but, but not necessarily in the classroom physically, but also in the virtual classroom. And so we're going to touch on both of those ideas. But um, there's going to be kind of three parts to our discussion. The first part, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we currently do in our classes, um, how we kind of currently think about questioning uh, our students. The second part, I'll offer some research-based recommendations on maybe what we could do uh, to, to maybe mix it up a little bit. And then I'm going to open it up to the group because we have got a breadth of experience and a wealth of experience here. Um, and there's no reason not to tap that. And so I would like to make sure that we um, hear from everybody and, and hear about your experiences and how you question students in your classrooms, both virtual and physical. That sound good? All right, good deal. We'll go ahead and get started then. So um, I do wanna mention that we're not gonna focus a whole lot on writing assessment questions. This, is, this isn't really a, a discussion on how to write a test. Um, this is mostly about uh, formative assessment, how we question in the classroom, how we uh, bring in discussion, how we ask and answer questions, things like that. Um, and, and you'll get a better feel for that here in a moment. Um, at various points, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let me make sure that I have got what I need ready to go here. I've got my trusty folder that I created to, for quick access. So um, I wanna kind of bring up one article or one publication that was written by Christine Chen back in 2007. She, um, she did a lot on, it was mostly K through 12, but she did a lot on uh, the analysis of question types. She was looking at science courses in K through 12, trying to understand better how teachers tend to ask questions and the types of questions that they ask. Um, it's, it's a really long paper and I'm not gonna open it up and, and walk you through it, but I, I do wanna point out, and if you'd like links to it, I, I can certainly, um, or I can certainly uh, give you, well, actually, instead of just telling you to do that, I, I can go ahead and do that very quickly because I, I made a folder after all, I might as well use it, right? So let's see here. So I don't, there it is, sorry. All right, so Christine Chin, this is uh, types of questions. Um, if you wanted to look at that, there's a really good table uh, that is, it's it, like I said, it's a pretty big uh, paper, uh, but if you look, there is a table uh, that is on page, it's nine of 29 in the PDF um, and there's two basic types of questions that I have seen asked in, in the 10 or so years that I've been observing STEM classes, and even outside of STEM for that matter. Um, and the, those two are pumping and verbal close. And both are really designed to encourage discussion. It's really, they're both really designed to try and get uh, students talking Unfortunately, often the way faculty use these types of questions, though, is, is um, you know, to, to ask a question so that they can take a sip of coffee. <laughs> um, you know, we want to be a little more intentional in our questioning. Now, verbal close and pumping questions are great. I, I don't, uh, I recommend you continue to use those, but, but, but we need to step it up a little bit. And so we're going to talk about that specifically here in a moment. But this is a really neat table. Whenever I'm, I'm uh, working with step fellows um, and um, I've, I've done some trainings for graduate students and undergraduate TAs and undergraduate LAs, 
we actually use this table as an exercise where we talk about the things that we already have in our toolkit um, and maybe some of the things we'd like to add to our toolkit. So I recommend that you, you know, if you want to read the paper, that's great. But this table is a really good place to start because it helps you think about what you're currently doing and maybe where you'd like to go for the next steps. Um, that's um, that's all, all we're going to do with, with this particular paper. I just wanted to make you aware of it. But my next question is, so why do we ask questions at all? And this is fairly rhetorical because I think everybody knows why we ask questions, right? Um, but I, I liken asking questions in class to athletic training. Now, I, I'm not going to go too too deep into this idea of athletic training because some of you may not do it. And I'm... I, I, I'm, I'm now very nervous by saying that because we now officially have a coach, a former coach in this conversation. So Dr. Lumpkin, please bear with me. Um, so uh, let me ask you this. If you've ever run a 5K or wanted to prepare for a 5K, um, did you just throw on a t-shirt and shoes and run out there and run three miles? Probably not. Um, that, that's, you can try it. Um, it may not go well. But that's not how we typically would do it. Um, probably what you do is you probably start off by walking around the block, right? Uh, or you probably find some, some shoes that are, are, aren't going to kill your feet, right? That's probably the first step. Then you're going to walk around the block. Maybe walk to the end of the street. You're going to do that a few times. Um, you're, you, it's probably going to be a month before you start jogging around the block, right? You've got to you've got to get your body used to that impact. You got to get used to, you know, oh, wow, breathing. That's important for this whole running thing, right? Um, you're probably going to do that a dozen times or more. And then eventually you might get to running a half mile. And then you're slowly going to build up and build and build and build probably over the course of several months before the big day, right? So what, why do I bring that up? Think about the way a student prepares for an exam or the way we hope they prepare for an exam and the way we should prepare them for exams. We're not going to walk into class one day and plop this test down on their table. It's worth 30% of their grade and say, okay, good luck. Um, well, we might actually some, some faculty do that. Right. And, and we have to think about, have we prepared them for that big assessment, that big summative assessment. And so, we don't often follow the training module or, or, or model, I should say, of, of kind of that your, your couch to 5K, so to speak. So what we often do is we, we talk at them for 50 minutes or 80 minutes, and we, you know, sprinkle them with pumping or verbal closed questions. Like I'll, you know, I'll make an example, um, you know, for my discipline, which is uh, biology, I'll, I'll say, um, so, uh, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, right? And everybody fills that in. And then I feel really good about myself because I asked questions, right? Well, that's not a question. That's, that's, that's me trying to convince myself that I'm asking questions. That's okay to get the ball rolling, perhaps, but it's not going to get them where you want them to be. Because what ends up happening is that we often ask all of these low ball, kind of low level questions, and, and I'll describe specifically what those questions are here in a moment. But we do that over and over, convincing ourselves that we have, you know, we've given them lots of questions and we've prepared them. And then we sit down and we write this assessment that's worth 30% of their grade. And then we hand it to them and then they, they're like bunnies in headlights. They look at this thing and they're like, where did this come from? So what I want to encourage is that we take the amount of time to write questions for class that we, that we put into writing our exams. You know, when we sit down, we write an exam, we really think through the exam. You know, how do we, you know, we try to match it with our objectives, with our student outcomes, our learning outcomes. You know, we were thinking about, you know, how we want to, uh, phrase the question, but then when we're in class, we just kind of willy-nilly ask a question, you know, and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's not planned, uh, it's not, um, you know, necessarily well thought out, and so what I want to do is encourage everyone to start thinking about the questions that you ask in class. Be very intentional about the questions that you ask. In fact, so intentional that you literally spend a PowerPoint slide to create 
a series of questions in between your, your, your content transfer, right? So every five, maybe 10 slides, put in a blank slide that says, and, don't, and not, it doesn't say ask a question here. No, it actually has the question on it. Because if we ask a question, if we say ask a question here, that means that we have to in, in the moment come up with a good question, right? Odds are you may not come up with the best question because we need to be very intentional in how we ask those questions. So I wanna pause there for a moment before I continue with this idea of, of how we intentionally ask questions and kind of open it up to the group and, and hear what you think so far and, and kind of hear of your experiences. Ken, I would add that I think it's more important than ever to be intentional and think through our questioning. Um, I don't know if any of you all are teaching face-to-face -face classes, but in my two this week, I have found that between the protocols and the mask and, you know, I'm, I'm not thinking as quickly on my feet as I have in the past. And, you know, I think we have to give ourselves grace with that, but I love the idea of thinking before the moment, Ken, and having them on the slide in notes that we, we have, because whereas I might have been able to do that more easily in past semesters just on the fly, I'm, I'm struggling a bit to do, and I know it's just the first week we'll get used to these routines, but I do think what you're saying is more important than ever. Thanks, Mitzi. I, I, I appreciate that because, uh, you know, it, Yes, we're experts in our content, but that doesn't mean that we're not a little bit distracted by what's going on in the classroom, whether it's right now during all this craziness or just, you know, the, the guys are out weed eating, you know, outside our classroom and that's distracting or, you know, you hear a cell phone go off and that's distracting. You know, it's just if you have a plan and you can stick to it, then you're far less likely to, to miss that opportunity for asking questions. So, yeah, Mitzi, thank you. Any other thoughts? Um. Yes, I um, started adding those slides last semester um, within my PowerPoints because when I prepared my lectures, I maybe thought of those questions, but when I was lecturing, I forgot <laughs> to ask the questions. Yep. Um, so I started incorporating those and I found that very useful, uh, not just for my lecture, but also it helps the student to understand the type of analysis I want, they to, I want them to make or the type of questions um, I will ask. So it, it was very helpful, I'll say for me and, and also for them. Thanks, Alexandra. Yeah, so Alexandra is uh, one of our pedagogical specialists in the STEM teaching engagement and pedagogy program. And um, I'm really honored to work with her. And, and we talked a lot about that last year about you know creating questioning and opportunity for questioning in the class. Yeah, thank you. I just, I just wanted to add um, the two classes that I teach are back to back. And so I know I often find myself in the second class, like, did I talk about this already? Did I ask this question already? Because you know, you may or may not have. So I do think having that on the slide will be super helpful. So I, I really like that idea. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. So, and, and I want to point out what type of questioning that is. So there's really kind of, there's two big types of questioning. Uh, and in fact, if, uh, if you're new faculty and you had the uh, honor of uh, watching Dr. Lumpkin talk about this uh, during new faculty orientation, she talked a little bit about the types of questioning. Uh, one's diagnostic, and then uh, the other two types that I'm gonna focus on are uh, formative and summative. And, uh, Summative is kind of how we've done it for a long time, right? Or a lot the way a lot of faculty do it, uh, where you just ask this big giant, you have this test with all these uh, big giant questions that are worth a ton of points and, and uh, it's at the end of a module that's two or three weeks long. And that's fine and I know that a lot of people do that. But, um, but I recommend some formative questioning before we get there. Um, the beauty of formative questioning is that it is low risk and high reward. Um, because if you're, if you're careful and intentional about the types of questions that you're asking in class, you can really bump up the rigor in those questions. You know, we talked a little bit about verbal close and we talked a little bit about pumping and those are really low ball questions. They're underhanded questions. And, um, and it's fine to, when you're, when you're teaching 
teaching your your child to to, to knock it out of the park, you want to give them an, a, a a slow underhanded pitch, but eventually you're going to have to start throwing some heat so that they're used to the big day. And so, um, sorry for all the sports analogies, y'all. I don't know where that's coming from, but um, I I think that if if we're intentional in our questioning, we can start thinking about Bloom's taxonomy, and I'm going to talk about that here in a second and what that is and how we can think about our questions and relate them directly to Bloom's taxonomy and even help us write our questions with that. So uh, formative questioning is really important. So that's a perfect way to segue into this idea of uh, using Bloom's taxonomy. I'm gonna go ahead and open up this slide here. I'm sure you have seen this before um, and you've probably seen it in various ways. I'm gonna share my screen. Everybody should see a big multicolored triangle on your screen. Is that what you're seeing? Great. Thank you for the nods. That helps. All right. So this is Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, this is nothing. This is not new. This is like from 1956. So this is nothing new. And we've been using this in faculty development since 1956. Uh, well, not that I remember that, but you get my point. Um, You'll see this, if you Google Bloom's taxonomy, you're gonna see it in a pyramid, you'll see it in a square, you'll see it in a table, you'll see it in a sphere, in a circle, in all kinds of ways, shapes, or forms. Uh, this has been researched ad nauseum. Um, it still holds today. You may see some slightly different words uh, in these very taxono various taxonomic levels. So for instance, where you see remember and understand here at the bottom, sometimes you'll see comprehension or comprehend. Uh, recall, things of that nature. But I want to point out the, the, the reason I like it in a triangle is because it kind of, it, it emphasizes um, this idea of a foundation, right? Because, you know, if we think of like Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we think of pyramids and we think of, you know, good structures, triangles and pyramids are a great way to think about that because the base is really important. So, that's where we come up with this idea of remembering and recalling facts. Sure, there, there is a time where lecture is absolutely appropriate. Sometimes you just have to get the information out there so that they've got some, some working knowledge of the content of your course and, and the context of your course. But our goal shouldn't be to stick around the lower levels, the remember and the understand. Um, if you're teaching a 1000 level course, sure, you might spend a little bit more time there, but if you're teaching 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 level courses, and certainly graduate level courses, you don't want to stick around the bottom of that pyramid for long. The idea is to move our students up that pyramid. We want to get them, if we can get them to create, or in, in some cases, the, the way you might see this, um, this pyramid, you might see synthesize up at the top or, or near the top. Um, this is this is kind of graduate level or senior level type stuff where we want to see students start to create some original work or some some predictive analyses and things of that nature. So, but we have to, if we're, again, if we're going from couch to 5k, we've got to start down here. We've got to get the first, you got to go buy a, a decent pair of tennis shoes and then we got to get out and we got to walk around the block first. So this is where remember and understand come in. So when you're creating your slides or your intentional questions, consider a three-part question on that slide. The first question could be a remember, you know, it could be a, a basic definition type question. Do you know what this word means? And then maybe the second question is moving more towards apply. So how would you take that definition and apply it to this formula or apply it to this theory or apply it to this exercise? And then maybe further down the road in that class or that per class period, or maybe even the course itself, move them towards analyze, evaluate, create. Start asking them to uh, maybe predict what a change in that thing that's, that the topic of discussion might result in. You know, if, you know if, if, if you're talking about positive integers, how does it change if you change it to a negative? you know, everybody can find an example in your discipline. And so um, this is just one way to do it. Now, what I like about this particular um, visual is that off to the side here, it really defines um, what is in 
each of these sections. And it also includes verbs. So I want to point out these verbs. When, when we're writing learning objectives, when we're writing questions for our students, whether it be formative questions for class, class time or summative questions, uh, summative questions for an exam, reference these verbs. This, it's kind of a cheat sheet in a way. It, it really helps you lock in on the type of question that you're asking. If you want to ask them, if you want to get them started with remember, uh, say define PCR. So, you know, everybody's, we're, we're, everybody's probably heard now of PCR. So PCR is actually a, a, a term for, um, you know, if, if we're thinking about COVID, PCR is a type of testing, right? Stands for polymerase chain reaction, and, and we're not going to talk any more about that. But um, define PCR. Um, that's that's a pretty low ball question, right? Because that just means, do they recall? Have they heard it before? And then I might say, well, how would we apply PCR, polymerase chain reaction? What what do we use that for? And then um, you know, so I could say. Um, see here, use PCR to describe how it would be helpful in determining if someone is COVID positive. Well, that's a, that's a much bigger question, right? And then I might say, eventually in a class, I might say, all right, now we're going to design a PCR experiment so that you can test for, uh, for COVID or for the presence of some gene or, or organism, right? So I took the same idea. I started off with very low ball. What, what is PCR? And then I said, well, what do we use PCR for? And now I want you to come up with an idea on how to use PCR to answer your own question. All in the same slide. Now, you know, you may need to spread that out through a class. So maybe have the, the low ball question in one slide and then have the middle level question somewhere down the, down the road in the, in the lecture. And then at the end of class, maybe say, okay, here's what I want you to think about for next class period. Um, get with your, you know, have your students, you know, start a group me or something like that because they do that anyway. So you might as well just acknowledge it. Um, you know, talk about this and, and we're going to talk about it next class period on how you're going to create this sort of experiment. So let me show you another uh, great resource for, um, for this, these verbs, these Bloom's taxonomy verbs. So this actually comes from um, Linda Nielsen's book. Um, this is, I mean, if you Google Bloom's verbs, you're gonna get back a lot of options, but this is a, a book called Teaching at Its Best. It's, I don't even know how old, old this book is now at this point, it's been around for a long time, um, but it is an amazing resource. But this is a, a bunch of those verbs. And I have to be honest with you, I have a cheat sheet. Well, I, I don't have it right here um, uh, these days, but when I was um, teaching full-time in biology, um, I actually had a printout of this in a sheet protector taped on my wall next to my desk. And when I was writing a quiz, I could just reach, is a cheat sheet. I totally looked over there and I said, okay, I need to write a good question. I want to get them towards application. All right. Um, interpret. Ooh, that's a good one. So then I would design a question around the word interpret. It's, it's such an awesome and simple reference that I really encourage you to use it. And so literally print the sucker off, put it in, a, in the top drawer of your, your desk and reference it as often as you can. So this is how you can be sure that you're covering these various Bloom's taxonomic levels. Right, so I think I saw a chat come in. I want to go ahead and look at that. Let's see here. Yes, can you get a um, a cheat sheet, a, a copy of this cheat sheet? Yeah, you can. I will. Um, I will do that. This is this is actually not a PDF. This is actually a, a screenshot. I, I actually scanned this page from the book, um, but um, I will. I will um, actually. Suzanne might have one that's handy. Um, maybe not, but, um, yes, I will, I will get one as we go to our question, uh, and in, in kind of the, the crowdsourcing component, I will grab that and I will put it in there, but yeah, you could literally bloom, uh, Google blooms verbs and you'll get a thousand hits on this. So thank you for that question. Um, so let me pause there.
and let's talk for a moment about this idea of creating questions using these Bloom's verbs, what your experience has been with using Bloom's verbs. Awesome, Mitzi, thank you. Um, so let's, let's hear, hear from everybody. So I'm gonna demonstrate something here um, because we're gonna talk about that here in a moment. But I know that Alexandra offered up her experience from you know a few moments ago. And so I know that Alexandra can answer this question. And so, which is, which is why I'm about to ask Alexandra this question. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, I, Alexandra. I have my chit chat though. <laughs> exactly, see, I, I know that. Alexandra, would you kind of describe your process for creating the questions that you said that you started to implement? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> Um, well, I actually, like what you said, I use my cheat sheet um, because it says it's very useful. Uh, I think that sometimes you, can't, you, you think you're being creative, but you're really not creating enough to bring those questions. Um, the other thing I do is I try to build on concepts like you were actually explaining. So I use a very basic concept, let's say a microorganism. So Salmonella causes diarrhea. So what if, and then I try to build a case, a more complicated case. So we all know that you can get diarrhea from Salmonella, from E. coli, but then I try to build a case. So I add something different. So what if that Salmonella is in X or Y food, or what is, what if the conditions change? So I just try to build that case and then uh, ask the question, write it on a PowerPoint. And with that, I force them to analyze. So I, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, and actually, I, I want to be honest with you all. I, I, I was struggling with these things when I was teaching and um, I learned this with Ken. <laughs> so it, it's been a very good tool to, to help these students analyzing more on theoretical concepts. Yeah, well, would you say that the students, as you are introducing more rigorous questions, are you seeing that the students are able to rise to the challenge? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, yes, and, and I saw that actually change uh, during my lecture. So when I was lecturing, I usually, I teach microbiology. So it's like any biology class is very straightforward. It's, it's, it's black or white. Um, but when you, when you don't ask them questions, what the students do is just memorize. But if they have a different scenario, then they, infor they are forced to analyze. So these questions are a very good tool that we can offer them to, to train them in analyzing situations rather than memorizing. And that's something actually I had to learn. I had to learn how to help them analyzing. Because you, you as, as the expert on the field, you're um, intrinsically able to analyze, but you really don't, you're not aware that they can't or they, they don't know how to do it. So. Yeah, and you bring up a really good point. How, how many of your, by a show of hands or clappy hands in the, the Zoom thingy, um, how many of your students ask for a test review? Like pretty much everybody, right? Well, the reason they are asking for a test review is because they have no idea what kind of questions you're going to ask on an exam, right? They are, they are, they're asking for anything, any clue that you're going to, that you can provide ahead of time of what's going to be on that exam. Um, how many of you hate that question? Do you, are you going to have a test review? <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, if you're asking questions all the time, they are far less likely to ask for a review because they're going to have a pretty good idea as to what what you're going to ask on the exam. If you're pushing them and increasing the rigor, as Alexander just described, getting them to analysis, I mean, that's, that's way up the Bloom's pyramid, right? If you're getting them to analysis, the exam, they'll be fine. Um, they're going to feel prepared 
because they probably are prepared because you have been formatively assessing them and they've been formatively assessing themselves throughout the class module before they get to that exam. The, the, request, the, the request for the review is almost always because they have, they have never really been asked rigorous questions and they're scared to death about that exam that's coming up. So consider that. Now I will, I will give you a little a tip um, and, and this is something I, I did back when I was teaching cell biology. Um, so uh, this is a nice way of providing them with a review. So I, I do uh, various techniques and, and, and um, strategies. One of them happens to be a muddiest point. And so I will ask them, uh, you know, please, you know, I would pass out index cards or I would go get colored sheets and I would slice them up and, you know, into kind of cheap index cards and I would pass them around and I'd say, please write your muddiest points on this card. And then we would do a series of switching things around and so on and so forth. And I would take some and I'd answer them. And we had a lot of ways of, of answering those questions, but it's basically where the student says, oh, I'm completely lost on this topic. You know, and, and it's very low risk. They don't have to raise their hand and say, I don't know what, I don't understand how PCR works, right? They can just say, what the heck is PCR? Please explain this again, all right? That's, that's telling me I didn't do a good enough job of explaining it. So I do this over the course of, uh, of, of a module, we'll say, for exam one. And what I did, and I wouldn't tell them that I was doing this, but I would, I would pick up the muddiest point cards at the end of every class meeting that I did a muddiest point. I wouldn't do it every class period, but I would do it probably once a week. And I would take those cards and I would literally type them out into a form, into a, into a Word document. And then a week before the exam, I would pass that Word document out. And I would say, if you can answer these questions, you're in good shape for the exam. So I basically, you know, hopefully we address their muddiest point questions in class because that also encouraged them to come to class, right? Hi there. Um, but it encouraged them to come to class because they know their muddiest points are going to be answered. But they also know, they eventually learned that those muddiest points were going to show up in their review that they could then answer as a study guide prior to the exam. So that's just one way that you can use a review that's not really the creation of a separate review, if that makes sense. Um, I want to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk specifically about something that I just demonstrated with Alexandra. I just cold called Alexandra, right? And um, the word cold calling has gotten a bad rap for a long time, right? Um, because it's seen as putting a student on the spot. It's seen as, you know, uh, you know, it, it's going to make them, it'll embarrass them. It, it, it puts them in an awkward position. And for years and years and years, we were told, oh, never, never cold call anybody because it's, it's a bad teaching practice. Um, Elise Dallimore, she's actually a communications expert. Um, I believe she's at Northeastern. She was at Northeastern. She, I'm not sure where she is now, but uh, she's kind of the, um, the cold calling expert. A lot of her research is specifically on cold calling. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. I've got a paper up here for you to take a look at. So this is one of her older papers. This is a 2012 paper. Um, and essentially, are y'all able to see that? Okay, cool. Um, so this is the impact of cold calling on student voluntary participation. I'll go ahead and, I'll go ahead and bring the abstract for you to, to go ahead and look at it. But basically, Cold calling leads to voluntary participation. That's what she was able to determine. Now, let's, let's talk about this idea of cold calling for a second. Yes, there is a punitive way to cold call and it's not, it's not good. You know, it can actually lead to students shutting down if we're, if we're not careful. But what I did a few minutes ago is I opened up the, the, dis the discussion for anybody to weigh in and Alexandra weighed in and she described what she was doing, right? And I know that she's doing this because we, she and I have talked about this for a year, right? And so when it came time to talk specifically or when I asked questions again, a few minutes later, it was silent, right? Nobody wanted to volunteer. Well, I just happened to know that Alexandra would know the answer to my question. And so 
then I singled her out. And sure, it was a little awkward. She was a little nervous at first, but I had, I promise I did not know that she would actually have the cheat sheet right there. And I was like, Oh, sweet. She's got her cheat sheet handy. But, um, but I knew that she would know the answer. It just so happened that she had the cheat sheet handy. Um, you can do that in class as well. So let's say, for instance, you want to try a think pair share. Okay, so you ask a question because you've got your slides that are up and you ask a question and you say, okay, everybody, I want you to go ahead and take a couple of minutes and turn to your neighbor six feet away and see what they think about this question. Now, um, quick recommendation on how to um, deploy a think pair share. Be very intentional in what you want them to do during that think pair share. I'm, I'm not a big fan of saying, okay, you guys discuss this question. It's okay, it's, it's, it's all right, but it's not very direct. Um, I'm a STEM guy, so maybe I'm a little too direct, but a lot of times what I'll say is, I want you guys to discuss this question and I want you to defend your answer to one another. Oh, that's, that's very specific, isn't it? So why, why is your answer correct? Now, if they both have the same answer, then, you know, talk, uh, talk amongst yourselves as to why that answer is correct. So, um, so during the think pair share, now, right now it's a little bit weird uh, because it's difficult to walk around our classroom and almost maybe not even allowed, um, but you, that doesn't mean you can't still kind of move to the side and, and listen to what's going on. It's very likely that you're gonna hear exactly what you wanna hear in that discussion. And so if you're at the front of the room, excuse me, and you hear um, uh, Mary and Steve talking about the answer to that question, and you are hearing exactly what you were hoping to hear. You can always walk over and say, Mary, you are right on the money on that question. You know what, here in a few minutes, I'm gonna ask if you would, wouldn't mind kind of explaining how you came to that con conclusion or how you came to that answer. And I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and, and talk in front of the whole class and explain how you got there. What you have just done is you have prepared that student for a cold call. You have, now she's gonna freak out for just a few minutes, but what she's gonna do is that she's gonna, you know, zone in, lock in on how she wants to answer your question so that she's ready for it when it comes, when it comes to her. And she's gonna be prepared, she's gonna be confident, she will know that her answer is correct because I told her her answer was correct. And she's gonna then hear her voice in that classroom. The other students are gonna hear her voice in that classroom. They're gonna see her confidence. They're gonna see that she, you know, had, you know, went into this with, with clear confidence and a clear response. And so when I, when, I'm, when I bring everybody back together as the whole group, I can say, all right, everybody. So um, I was listening into Mary and Steve's discussion and I would just, I, I would like to hear what Mary had to say about uh, this particular topic because it was something that, that I was hoping that y'all would think about. And she really did. I wanna, so I see I'm building her up. I'm building her up, building her up. And then when then all of a sudden she's now she feels like a million bucks as she sits there and says, well, here's what we discussed and here's how we, we, we can came to a conclusion. Other students see that and they're like, cool, that, that wasn't horrible. She, she handled that. But what it does is it also says, I'm going to do that again. So you, you put this, you build this into the fabric of your course. You make sure that students are aware from day one that you, that this is going to be a discussion based course. You're going to ask questions and you're going to expect them to answer it. Now what Elise Dallimore determined is that you only have to do this a few times. You only need to cold call a few times because what ends up happening, volunteerism increases. They start to hear their voice in class. They start to see other people speak up. Confidence grows students start to realize that you've got a, a very comfortable classroom environment. It's okay if we're not quite 100% correct because nobody's gonna say, no, you're wrong. Everybody's, you know, if, if they had the answer to all the questions, we wouldn't need to be in the class, right? So the beauty of this is that it slowly builds rapport in your classroom. That's the key to cold calling, building rapport, building a comfortable environment in your classroom. And so I want to draw your attention to another, a more recent Dallimore um, publication. And this one is really cool. 
So she actually determined in a 2019 paper that how cold calling actually levels the field in terms of gender equity. So this is a 2019 paper and let me reduce the size a little bit so that I can pull up the abstract. And basically I will draw your attention uh, to this. Um, basically results indicate in high cold calling classes that women answer the same number of volunteer questions as men. That's pretty cool, huh? Additionally, increased cold calling did not make either group uncomfortable. Differences were observed between men and women in low cold calling environments where women answered fewer questions. So basically by, by cold calling, you can be intentional about who you're calling on as well as what the question is, but we actually see that there's an increase in volunteerism and success with both women and men in your classroom. So cold calling actually makes your class more equitable. I mean, how cool is that? It's a 2019 paper. And so um, I think that, that tells me that this is something worth talking about, worth doing in class. But again, I will stress that it's really important that we, we build this into the fabric of our course from day one. Don't, don't save it till the middle of the semester when they're used to being lulled into this kind of spoon feeding process where they can just passively sit in class and not engage. Uh, because when you start cold calling, it's going to be like, whoa, where'd that come from? You know, we don't want that to happen. We want to introduce them, introduce it early, get them used to it. You know, start that, that couch to 5k early, right? So I'm going to take a glance at the chat here for a second and I'm going to offer some uh, offer uh, for the next eight minutes, I'm going to offer some tips on how you do this online. And then in the last 10 minutes, I want to kind of open it up to the group. So let me take a glance at the chat here for a second. Come on, chat, open up. There it goes. All right. Can I just want to say something? Please, please jump in. Uh, first of all, I totally agree with Kent, what Ken just said about cold calling. Uh, I've now taught my two classes for this semester. They're both graduate classes at night. And I was, I, I was totally unprepared for the hesitancy of, these are graduate students, and you can imagine what will be for undergraduates, to speak when wearing a mask. Mm. And I, I, I did, none of us want to be in masks. We all are but it there was a great deal of hesitancy and as i began to ask questions because i'm a big believer in questions i think the cold calling and the affirmation that it's okay to have a muffled conversation to a class as a whole and to a class and a think pair share or talk to your neighbor about uh, a question that was phrased to the old class and i could just see a measurable change over again it was a two and a half hour class period we've got to reaffirm to these students that we're not that abnormal. I mean, the new normal on this campus and elsewhere is wearing the mask. And so what we have to do is we have to say, you can have a class, you can interact and meet your classmates in this format, and we've got to affirm it and affirm it and reinforce it. And they don't have to be in each other's face, they can be a reasonable distance apart and they can still talk with each other, they can still answer questions, you can still cold call. And I think we have to build their confidence even more so than what Ken just said under the current circumstances. So I encourage everyone to follow what Ken said and then maybe even do it a little bit more to, to break people through. Now I'll just read one comment, I'm setting up meetings with my students and I've already had heard from one student, I was concerned about coming to class but you assured, reassured me that it's going to be all right. Mm. And I think that has to do with the distancing. I think it has to do with the mask and it has to do with them wanting to be college students and, and continuing to learn during a pandemic. Angela, thank you so much for that. I mean, that, that couldn't be more timely. I appreciate you mentioning the, the mask thing because yeah, it's, it's, it's noticeably weird, right? So I'm sure it, it does have an effect. Thank you for that. Hey Ken, can I also point one other thing out that's um, a little bit indirectly related, but but maybe not. Please. Um, you just did something, and I, I think we we love to do this at the TLPDC, which is to talk about the way that we're we're actually leading a workshop and point out a strategy. 
And I feel a lot of pressure in teaching in an online context um, to, <laughs> to manage everything at one time and to keep my eyes on the screen and, and also to keep my eyes on the chat. And it's impossible um, for me, at least. I, I can't do it. And you were really intentional about saying, hey, I'm going to stop now. I'm going to pause and I'm going to take a look at the chat and see what questions we have there and see what's happening there. So it's another way to prompt questions and, and also to take a break, break and cut yourself some slack as the instructor and say, I'm gonna have a look at this now. Let's see what great questions were in, or comments were in the chat. So I love the way you did that and I just wanted to point that out. Thanks for mentioning that, Suzanne. But you also noticed that it, it left some silence and some space for Angela to, to jump in, right? So, so that's, that's another reason that, that that worked out really well. Awesome, thank you, Suzanne. So um, I want to offer something that is a fairly recent discovery, um, you know, uh, on how to do this in a distance modality, uh, specifically in a synchronous distance modality. I'm not sure if anybody is doing that right now, but, um, so I, part of my gig here in the TLPDC is that I'm you know, working with learning assistants, uh, which are undergraduate students that are um, embedded in live courses. And I'm working specifically with two different uh, departments, but this example is over in calculus. So I'm working with Dr. Brock Williams, who's you know, associate chair over there, professor, you know, mathematician extraordinaire, member of the teaching academy. He's, he's a rock star teacher, right? Um, we have been, so over the summer, we were, um, we implemented LAs, um, and what we were finding is that we had these um, students where they're, they were not engaging. The, 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 the cameras were off, the mics were off, and even we would ask, you know, pumping questions and verbal close questions, and uh, we would go into breakout rooms, and we do all kinds of stuff, and, and the LAs were prepared and ready to go, and, and yet when they go in the breakout rooms, they would have these black boxes with their name across it. And so we're, we were really trying to figure out how were we gonna get them going. So we came up with this idea, and we, it was kind of a, a, an experiment at first, and the increase in uh, engagement has tripled. And I'm gonna go ahead and explain to you what we did. This is a method that's all carrot and no stick, okay? Um, so what we did was, um, so it's set up so there's um, a certain number of uh, learning assistants to, uh, to, to groups, right? So in this particular group, we have you know, about 10 students for every learning assistant. You don't have to have learning assistants to do this. What you can do is you can create breakout groups. And if you haven't, um, if you don't know how to do that, our, our colleague here on the TLPDC, Erica Brooks Hurst, has, has done some uh, YouTube videos. So I point you in that direction where she describes how you do that. Um, we can also talk offline if you need some help on that. But anyway, you can create breakout groups in, in Zoom. And I, I suggest pre-assigning certain groups to certain students or certain cer certain students to certain groups so that these groups kind of start and they maintain as the same group and what we did was during the during the class dr williams would actually have a moment where he'd say okay I've, i'm done talking we're going to ask a question now and you're going to solve a problem so we're going to go to gr breakout groups we're going to spend five minutes and you're going to solve this problem go bam and then everybody shoots into their breakout groups and then their assignment is, is that they, they need, as a group, they need to come up with the answer to this question because when they come back into class, he is, now um, I, I will uh, tell you, uh, Dr. Williams is a big Dungeons and Dragons fan and he's got all these dice. So he loves to roll dice to, to select di different groups randomly, right? So um, when they come back into the main group, he rolls his 20-sided dice and selects a group. So group eight. All right, group eight. That's awesome. So group eight, you're going to uh, need to answer this question. And then he rolls a dice uh, for an individual within that group. So it's random. So let's say, Suzanne, awesome. So you're, you're going to need to answer this question. So again, they, the students know about this well in advance. This is part of the fabric of the course. And so that student then gets to weigh in on the question. Now, 
it's up to you to determine what is a quality answer. Is it, did they set the problem up correct? Did they, you know, get the right answer? Did, you know, you can create your own rubric for what is an acceptable answer, or what is considered correct, right? But here's, here's the thing. The biggest concern with the groups was that the students were not engaging. You had some groups that were, or some students that were, some groups, students that weren't. Here's the all carrot, no stick part. So if the student gets it right, everybody in that group gets a bonus point. Now, it could be towards the exam, towards the final grade, towards the quiz grade, towards the participation grade. It doesn't matter because points are king, right? The students want to see points. Um, if they get it wrong, no points are conferred, but they don't lose anything either. Now, again, what is wrong? We have to be careful about what is wrong. You know, we, we often in the TLPDC will, will use this term kernel of correctness where we, you know, identify something about what they said that is correct and we kind of draw it out of them. And if we do that and, and they're on board and they can answer the question, then it's correct, right? Because we want them to continue to respond. So if it's correct, then boom, everybody in that, um, that group gets a, gets, a, gets a point. So what does that do? That actually raises, raises student accountability within that group to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Right. So if I'm a student, so if I'm in a group with Suzanne and Mitzi and I'm the guy that doesn't quite understand what we're talking about, but Mitzi and Suzanne absolutely understand what's going on, they're going to make sure that I understand because when it comes time to share with the group, their extra point rides on me being able to answer that question. Right. Um, and so I, because I'm the slacker, you know, slacker guy that doesn't know the answer and I always have my camera off, you know, they're going to make sure that I'm on it. Um, it benefits Suzanne and Mitzi too, because they have the opportunity to explain this concept in a couple of different ways to make sure Dummy Ken gets it, right? And so um, it's, a, it's a win, win, win all the way around. And we saw, we went from, and, and so I, you know, as a co-host in these, these classes, I can kind of jump around in the various groups. And it was amazing to see cameras on, students engaged, the black boxes were no more, they were gone, microphones were on, there's chatting, chatting, chatting. And a, a byproduct of this was that the LAs now are competing with each other as to whose group is better. And, and it's, it's, it's awesome. And, and so, like I said, you don't have to have LAs to do this. You can put the accountability on the students and then you can go in and you can jump from group to group and kind of see, make sure that the accountability is working, but they are accountable to each other and to themselves. And so you very, you have to spend very little time, you know, making sure that they're staying on task. So that's, that's just one example. And if you wanted some more details on how we did that, um, I'm, I'm happy to share them with you, but it's turned out so well that we're actually talking about trying to write this up. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about that. But in our remaining time, we've got about eight minutes left or so, I want to open it up for your questions and for your, uh, your comments and your experiences and things like that. So I will hush and I want to turn it over to y'all. Do some of these techniques work in asynchronous classes? That's a really good question. A, so we, we like to recommend asynchronous because it's a lot easier to deploy and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. They do work in asynchronous classes as long as you have some sort of substantive um, interaction with the students, either through a discussion group or a live chat or um, a, an asynchronous posting type process. It, it does work, but if, if you treat your distance course like a correspondence course, then it's less likely to be that effective. And in fact, we, we really recommend against the idea of treating your distance asynchronous course as a correspondence course. There should be some form of, of interaction. Um, and, but yes, it, it will work if you build it into that interaction. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Dan, just to uh, hit on a little bit of how I'm doing my asynchronous course, uh, I have, so what I'm trying to do is you know, essentially add in a slide with a question, uh, a series of questions. And I, I kind of do it the low ball, medium, and then a pretty tough question that's going to have discussion. And then 
because thankfully I have a still a face to face time where I have uh, discussion time with my students. The, the students are broken into three parts. I can still have those questions answered because I have tried already this year to get them to use the discussion board and that is not working. They are not, they're not utilizing the discussion. Yep. Yeah, so thanks, Darren. Um, did, did I lose your audio or are you still? Okay. Nope, nope, uh, no, okay, good. Because I'm getting the little bars that says uh, connecting to audio, sorry. Um, so yes, if you have an asynchronous course where it's somewhat hybrid, where you're delivering content, perhaps in a semi-flipped mode, and the content is going in an asynchronous uh, uh, method where they watch the videos ahead of time and then class is treated as kind of a, a, a time to, to do application, then that class time is a really good way to be able to spend uh, that, um, uh, that time actually asking them questions and deploying some of these ideas. But yeah, the, the thing with the discussion is that you have to, a, a stagnant discussion is forgotten very quickly. Um, you have to, it's like if you're a Twitter person or any kind of social media person, which I'm not. So if, if you are, um, I will defer to my communications experts. But um, if, if you're not constantly updating that feed, people eventually start to ignore what you're saying. And so discussions are really important. If you're going to do it, you have to make sure that you're constantly uh, feeding that discussion. There's a lot of care and feeding to discussion that has to be done. So um, I, I see some things coming in through the, the chat here. Um, let me see here. Some students gave me feedback last semester that they really disliked being asked questions at 8 a.m. in the morning. Any suggestions for getting around student fatigue? And then uh, Suzanne weighed in. Uh, I think your energy will influence the class and the early expectation that they will be participating despite the hour of the day. Yeah, eight, eight o'clock is, is difficult, right? And especially depending on the, the concept or the, the, the topic of conversation, because I'm currently, one of my learning assistants courses is an 8 a.m. chemistry class. No human should be subjected to 8 a.m. chemistry, right? Um, but the, uh, the, the fact is, is that, that 8 a.m. is still when we're teaching. And so, yes, Suzanne's comment of, if we walk in there excited to be there and we, um, uh, you know, excitement is contagious, right? Maybe contagious is not the right word to use these days, but um, it, it's, it's really important that we model how to be excited and interested in the material. So if you walk in there with your coffee and you're like, all right, y'all, we're going to balance some equations today. Um, then they're going to be like, okay, I'm going to sit here and watch the YouTube, right? Um, but if you walk in and say, all right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Here's, you know, what we talked about last, last time. Here's what we're going to do today. You know, have some energy. You know, if, if, if you don't leave your classroom exhausted, you're probably not doing it right. Right. So, so thank you for, for that, uh, that topic and for the response, Suzanne. Other thoughts? Um, and I, I just have a question. So you suggested for online classes that one of the option is to break them into the rooms and etc but if you don't do that what other suggestions are there for questioning or to engage the students so if you don't break them into breakouts right so um, is it a synchronous course or an asynchronous course synchronous so synchronous so um well we tried in, in calculus we tried not breaking them out um, and the reason we ultimately did breaking, we, we broke them out is because we weren't getting the engagement we wanted. Um, and so it's kind of that problem that we have with face-to-face -face courses when we're in a large lecture hall and nobody wants to speak up because it's intimidating. Well, now nobody wants to speak up because they're, they're get, you know, they got this camera right in their face and it's really easy to not speak up because all I have to do is turn off my camera, right? Then I'm just a, I'm just an anonymous participant. Um, you can, you can beg them until you're blue in the face to face, blue in the face to ask them to turn their cameras on. They will not do it. <laughs> so that's why we actually implemented um, breaking them out into groups. So we tried several ways to try and get them engaged when they were in the, the whole group and we had, we, we failed at every turn. So yeah, I, I don't have a whole lot of successful ideas on how to do that. I have a lot of 
failed ideas on how to do that, but, but not many successful ideas on how to do that in one group. So I, if, if there's a way to group them up and put them in, in breakout groups, I, I would really try to figure out a way to make that work. Then can I ask something else? Please, Valia. So um, based on your experience and the other participants, have you seen any difference if we just put up a question in a, a PowerPoint slide or if we use any polling system? Does it make it easier for the students to engage because it's kind of anonymous? And yeah, polling. Equally effective or any suggestions on that? Yeah, absolutely. Polling software is fantastic. A lot of times um, faculty will not use polling software because it's an extra cost or it's, uh, you know, it's not approved by the university or all kinds of various reasons. I want to show you something very quickly, uh, and this might answer Alexandra's question. So even if you don't have polling software, there's something called ABCD cards. And this is it's a free app. It's from West University of Western Washington. So if you wanted to ask a question on the screen and you, and you make it in a multiple choice format, you can say, okay, everybody, here's the question of the day um, or of this 10 point or uh, 10 slide question, formative question. Um, let me know which, what you think it is. And then they click on D and they can literally hold it right here in front of them in front of themselves. Oh, there we go. They can hold it in front of themselves. So they're not like, everybody's not looking around to see what the answer is, right? But you can see what the answer is. And you can see if you see a bunch of blue in the room, that tells you, if you see a homogenous, you know, room of blue, that tells you that, that you know, they're on, on target and you can move on with the next question. Now, if you see a rainbow of fruit flavors, if you see red, yellow, green, blue, and it's very heter heterogeneous, that tells you that there's some confusion. So you might wanna back up and rephrase your question or review that question or have them break into peers and say, okay, now turn to your neighbor and get to a consensus. Let's find out what the correct answer is. Um, this is actually recommended. So Eric Mazur did a lot of work on peer instruction. Um, physicists, so um, Valia and uh, Giannis, you might be familiar. Actually, I know Giannis knows Eric Mazur. How cool is that? Um, but um, anyway, um, he did a lot of work on peer instruction. Hey, Giannis, did a lot of work on peer instruction. And this is a really good way to assess the room. And so, um, Alex, if you're still in the room, you can, you can try that method to see how that works because yeah, they're still going to have to turn their camera on and Ooh, I just thought of a side hustle. We can come up with an app that turns their the black box into a color so that they don't have to show their face. They can change the color. Anyway, just an idea. But um, that's the ABCD cards is a way of doing polling, Valia, where you don't have to use software to do it. Um, but yeah, absolutely. The polling software. So, you know, various publishers have, you know, Top Hat and Pearson and McGraw-Hill. They all have some sort of polling as part of their their thing. So yeah, I totally encourage polling. It's a really good way to, to assess your students. Poll Everywhere is free. And if you have a class below 40, everybody can be independent and it's anonymous. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Angela. And Zoom has some polling built into it where you can actually use the built-in uh, utility to poll within Zoom. And, and it's really pretty easy to use. So I encourage you to try that as well. So I, I do want to make sure that, that I'm respectful of your time. It, it is a couple of minutes after we went over. Um, thank you so much for coming to, uh, to this session and contributing. Uh, got a bunch of great ideas from everybody. Um, I'm happy to share anything that, that I have uh, included in this, this PowerPoint or I'm, I no PowerPoint in, in this presentation. But um, if you have questions or comments or you want to reach out and discuss this some more, please do so. Um, I really appreciate all of your feedback and um, I, I guess we'll kind of end it there. Cool.